Hello, everyone. Uh, let's welcome our second speaker for today, Neptali Martinez, who is going to talk on the topic managers as coaches. He is the founder and principal at NJM Career Leadership Coaching, which provides career and executive coaching for professionals in middle and upper management levels, business owners and entrepreneurs in diverse areas. Welcome, Neptali. The stage is all yours. Okay, I will start with the problem. It seems that these days, in everybody's lips, there's a term, toxic work environment. Yes, toxic work environment. And many times, the toxic label is attached to the manager, is attached to supervisor, is attached to the leader. You know, the kind of leader that yells on screens, the kind of leader that asks you to do something and expects it to be done yesterday. The kind of leader that does not respect you as an individual, as a professional. The kind of individual that undermines you. And at the end of the day, he or she pulls the rock from under you. Next slide, please. Just like Lucy does when she takes the ball away from Charlie Brown when he comes to play. Next slide, please. Now, on the other hand, I'm sure you also came across good leaders, good managers. The ones that respect you as an employee, as an individual, the ones that offer you opportunities for growth, the ones that are concerned with your career, with your profession. I've had my share of toxic managers, but I have also been lucky to have good managers. And today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about one of those good managers. Next slide, please. I have been promoted to a director position working for the senior person in the C-suite. And her office happened to be on the other side of the building in relation to where my office was. So it was a surprise one day when she shows up in front of my office. I was concerned, I said, I'm in trouble. But in a polite voice, she says, Natali, do you have a few minutes? Come myself and come those. I said, sure, I have a few minutes, please come in. As she comes into the office, she turns around and she says, may I close the door? Ah, that's what I knew. I'm in trouble. She's closing the door. But as she closed the door and she sat across from my desk, she looked at me in the eye and she said, Natali, I have a problem. I need your help. Now, let's think for a moment. As I said, her office was on the other side of the building. Why would she come all the way? to see me in my office, to talk to me face to face. When she could have picked up the phone, she could have called me and summoned me to her office and tell me about the problem and asked me to fix it. She could have asked the secretary to call me, to summon me to her office. She could have sent an email. She could have explained the problem in the email and asked me to finish, asked me, give me a deadline, but she didn't do any of that. After that, I kind of got used to she showing up and announced, and then it dawns me that what she was doing was she was nurturing me. She was guiding me. She was coaching me. With her actions, she was showing me how to be a better boss. So today we're gonna to be using that as a reference to kind of have an idea how managers can be coaches, how they could be good leaders. Next slide, please. So as we get into here, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking a little bit about managers, you know, what managers do, what managers are. And then we're going to be talking about what coaches do and what coaches, you know, typically uh, deal with. And then we're going to try to mesh both of them into kind of a new manager as coach role. And in order to do that, we're going to be examining how we communicate because that's going to change a little bit. Uh, managers com communicate in a specific way. Coaches communicate in a specific way. So we're going to be talking about communication. We are also going to be talking about how to develop relationships. Typically, as a coach, we develop a relationship. We start a relationship with a coachee, right? Managers, a lot of times, don't have time or don't focus in developing a relationship with the uh, clients, with the uh, direct reports and all that. So we're going to be talking about how to develop, how to strengthen those relationships. And then we'll see how once we improve communication, once we improve our style, 
And once we develop relationships, we're going to be able to rely on the team. We're going to be able to rely on those that, that we work with to find the answer in the room, to rely with them, to do better work together. Okay. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, what we're going to be doing. Next, please. So uh, a bit of a disclaimer. Obviously, we're not replacing the manager position. The manager position is a key position everywhere, an important position. And, you know, I may be saying some negative things about some managers, but we're not undermining the role. Just the opposite. We're going to be adding a layer. We're going to be expanding the role. All right. Next, please. So uh, go back one. All right, um, everybody knows what the manager is. Everybody knows what a manager does. But for the purpose of today's uh, conversation, we're going to come up with a very simple description. A manager is a person responsible for controlling or administri administering all or part of a company or similar organization. A simple description of a manager. Next, please. Now, because we are going to be dealing with change, we're gonna be changing the role, we're going to be changing how you communicate to people. Uh, the potential for some level of conflict is going to be there because people tend to overreact to change. People tend to push back when, when it comes to change. So to help us deal with conflict, to help us minimize the conflict or even avoid conflict, we're going to be using the five elements of the wheel of conflict. Uh, we're going to borrow that from Jeff Thompson. And he gives us five areas. Uh, he talks about the structure of conflict. He talks about the emotions that we may find in the conflict. He talks about the history that may be coming into the conflict, uh, communication styles in order to minimize or eliminate conflict, and the values that a lot of times we assume in the you know the participants of the of the conflict. So we be we're going to be talking about that a little bit more. Next one, please. So let's start with the structure. And we could see the dynamics between two individuals that are having some kind of conflict. And if it's the boss and employee, we could see the balance, the disbalance. You know, the manager has the upper hands, has the control, has the information, and the employee kind of, you know, just goes along. And that could be the source of conflict, um, adding or creating the conflict, that disbalance. Time, time could be an issue. Maybe we don't have enough time. Maybe they gave us a tight deadline. Uh, and we have no control as employees, we have no control of that. So that could create conflict, could add to the conflict. Access could be another aspect. Uh, access to information, access to authority, access to resources. If we don't have access, that could be creating conflict. So that's in terms of the structure. Next, please. Uh, emotions, I don't have to say that. Uh, in any conflict, we could clearly see how emotions could get out of hand. Uh, this reminds me a situation I had with a client. This client of mine, he was an executive that he got tired of working for somebody else and decided to create his own business, his own company. So he knew the industry, he knew the product, he knew uh, the business, uh, but he was having issues dealing with his own clients. So he hired me to help him deal with that. So one day, a potential client asked him, for an estimate for a project. So let me call my client, let me call him the business owner. So the business owner prepare a nice document with estimates, with times, with figures and everything and send it to the potential client. And they agreed to talk about that in a week. So a week goes by and the potential client calls the business owner and they talking. And the business owner realizes that the potential client has another expert with him. And the business owner begins to feel insulted. He begins to feel hurt. How could he get somebody else? And then when the potential client starts asking the business owner questions about the estimate, about the numbers, about the time and all that, he was about to explode. Luckily, not luckily, he was smart. He stopped the call and he made up some excuse about emergency and he said, I'll get back to you. And then he calls me and he says, look, Natalia, I have this problem. This potential client, you know, asked me for all that. I did that. I did my, my best work. I gave him my best numbers and all that. And look, he went and got somebody else. And then he's questioning all my work. You know, and then I let him vent 
And then I begin to ask him. And I say, why do you think he is asking all those things? Why do you think he went and consulted with somebody else? I said, anybody, any client has the right to get a second opinion. They could even get a third opinion. You know, your potential client is about to embark on a big costly project and he doesn't understand your figures. He doesn't understand your approach and he's calling you to find out more. He has a, another expert, but he trusts you and he's calling you and he wants you to clarify. He's freaking out over there and he wants you help. So he hung up with me. He went and talked to his client. And of course, with a different attitude, with a different mindset, he was able to calm the potential uh, consult, uh, client. He was able to provide more information. He was open to it and he didn't feel his emotions anymore. So in his case, he was able to uh, deal with his emotions and also be able to calm himself so his emotions did not get out of the way. So if we cannot control our emotions, things can, you know, disputes can blow out of proportion. So emotion is a big thing that we need to be aware of how we deal with. Next one, please. History. It could be that you have, uh, you know, past history with your employees, with your colleagues and all that, and there may be loose ends. And if you didn't take care of that, sometimes when you try to make change, that's when things explode. So make sure if there's a past history that you take care of things. Make sure if there's some loose ends that you tie them and you leave everything neat. Because if you try to make change, that's when everything comes out and makes things worse. Uh, it, it creates people, uh, makes people have the wrong assumptions because of the past history. So clarify any bad history that you may have with uh, people that you're going to be working with. Next one, please. Communication. Communication is very, very key. How you tell the me a message, the, cho the words that you choose, your body language, your presence, how you present yourself to say uh, anything has a lot to do. This reminds me of a story about an uh, individual. He was not feeling well, and he went to see the doctor. And said, the doctor, I haven't been feeling well. You know, I don't know what's going on with me. I don't know what's wrong. So the doctor does some analysis, does some tests, and says, you know, come back in a couple of days. I have test results, and I'll be able to talk to you better. So two days go by, and the person goes back to the doctor, and the doctor says, OK, I have results. And I have to tell you the following. Uh, next slide, please. So the doctor says, um, you need an operation. Uh, you, you know, the results show that. And the person is surprised, an operation? You know, what does that mean? You know, I was not expected to have an operation. Doctor, tell me what are my chances? You know, what are the odds? I, I don't know what could happen. So the doctor has these numbers. I remember managers also have a lot of information, have a lot of figures. Uh, they always write because they have figures. So the doctor also is equipped with good numbers. And the doctor has these numbers. Um, and he chooses the following. He says, okay, what I can tell you is that 90% of the people that undergo that operation are still alive after five years. So that's kind of a good news to the person he feels that, okay, you know, chances are good, you know, and, you know, I'll be able to kind of go to the operation and, you know, I'll be okay. Now, let's look at that. Okay, those are the numbers. And the doctor, I'm sure he put a good presence. I'm sure he put himself in a positive attitude. I'm sure he made eye contact with the, you know, uh, patient. And I'm sure he had a positive, calm attitude when he was saying that because we're talking about a serious situation, right? Suppose he used the 10%, and the 10% would have been 10% of the people that go undergo the operation are dead within five years. So that's the same numbers, uh, but how we choose to you know, put a positive message, a hopeful message, right? Uh, the next slide, please. And how we tell the message, uh, the presence that we have, the face, even, you know, the smile. For instance, if you look at the lady on top, you know, we, we could see that she's fully smiling. That's an honest smile, an honest face. But if we look at the lady in the bottom, you know, she's smiling. We could see her teeth, but look at her eyes. So when we communicate, let's make sure that we put a whole, you know, uh, body language that are, we're smiling with our eyes. We're showing an open, honest face. Next one, please. 
the values. Different people have different wants, needs, and goals. When we talk about developing relationships, that will be one reason why we want to develop deeper relationships with our workers, with our colleagues and all that, because then we could learn more about their wants. We could learn more about their needs, the goals, and we'll be able to talk to them differently because we know a little bit more about that. Because otherwise, we may be trying to apply our values. We may be trying to apply our beliefs, our needs, and to others. And that, you know, that may be the best intentions that we have, but it's going to backfire because we are using our intentions, our ideas on others. So we need to be aware of what the values of others are. So when we make decisions, when we make some changes, we don't step on their toes, we don't hurt them uh, without you know, realizing. Next one. So now let's begin to look at the title, the position, the managing. And let's start with the essence of a manager. The essence of the manager is control. Managers typically organize the work and process to deliver results, and that's a tall order. And in order to handle that, they use control. They use the authority that they have uh, in order to be able to push for that. And managing usually involves one-way communication. We know that. We know that managers back quarters, managers tell you what to do and you just go ahead and do it. So typically it's a one-way communication. There's no way of talking back to the manager. Things need to be done and he or she wants things to be done and they're gonna tell you, do it, right? Next, please. So also in the management position, the horizon turns to be short. You may be, you know, this may be Monday, and the deadline may be Friday. So maybe the, uh, the deadline for the project is going to be at the end of the month, perhaps a quarter, but not longer like that. Typically the horizon for a project is shorter, right? That's typically uh, from the manager's point of view. And like I said before, the managers rely on the official title. The official titles give them the authority, give them the power, and they use that. Right? And as a manager, they, the actions tend to be reactive. Things go wrong, they go back to the manager. Somebody needs a question, the manager is going to answer. Something happened, the manager is going to resolve. So they are always ready to react. And that's the nature of the job. That's what happens when you are a manager. Next one, please. When we look at coaching, on the other hand, that's a different point of view. When I was reviewing for this uh, presentation, I came across an interview uh, on Michael Jordan, and they asked him what he thought was his best ability. Now, I'm thinking him be, being Mike, Michael Jordan, I'm thinking that his ability is to jump high, or his ability is to be able to hit the hoop. You know, his eye-hand coordination is the best in the business. But he didn't say that. Instead, he said, I was coachable. I was a sponge and aggressive to learn. And then it dawns on me that he got to be that good because he was always learning. He was always open. He had an open mind and he always wanted to learn more. That's how he got to be as good as he was. He was that close. So coachability, being coach is a big thing. Could you, the next one, please. So coachability is a big thing, and I wrote a book about that. And I ask, as, as part of the title of my book, I say, are you in the, in the state or condition to be coach? Being able to be coach is a big thing. So if you're working with your team, you have to create an environment in which they can be coach. You have to give the message for them to receive that they can be coach, they can be open, they can, they can trust you for them to be open so you could coach them. So that's kind of creating on your part as a manager, you need to create an environment and people also need to have an open mind to be able to be coach. Next, please. So some views on coaching, and I'm gonna read this. The purpose of coaching is to unlock people's potential to maximize their own performance. Take another look at that. The purpose of coaching is to unlock people's potential to maximize their own performance. So here we shift from the focus of the manager on him being right and having the right date and all that. Here we focus on the individual. 
here we focus on unlocking the potential of the individual. And the coaches help employees to learn rather than teaching them to, uh, or telling them. So we're going to be looking at how they learn to learn. We're going to be looking at how we develop them. So that's kind of the shift that we come from being managers telling them what to do, that we're going to try to develop them so they learn to learn. All right? Next one, please. So here, one way to achieve that is that in coaching, there's a two-way communication. In coaching, we have conversation, we have dialogues. Um, it's not just telling what to do, but it's asking questions, allow them to think, allow them to be open, allow them to share, right? And in coaching, the horizon, the, the horizon is longer. You could imagine that if you have an employee that you feel can be a manager, that probably you would want the person to, uh, to follow a real manager for maybe a year to learn the whole cycle of the business before you could even think of you know, assigning the role to the person. And maybe after they have shadowed the manager for a year, maybe you send them to a couple of classes for another couple of months of training. And then maybe after that, you allow the person to test as a manager. So the horizon, in that case, will be longer. It will not be at the end of the week. It will not be at the end of the month. It will not even be at the end of the quarter if that is going to take longer, right? Um, in this case, the control moves away from the manager into the individual. The individual is responsible for their success, for their achievement. The individual is going to be managing that. And once the success takes place, then the celebration, then the credit goes to the employee. So the credit moves away from managers that typically want to take credit, and the credit goes to the individual because of their own individual achievements. Next, please. Now, by now you begin to realize that we're talking about change. And for that, we'll be bor borrowing leadership traits. Uh, because while managers focus on stability, keeping the assembly line running, meet, meeting the deadline, reaching the quarter, coaching focuses on change, okay? And leadership co uh, also focuses on change. So we'll be talking a little bit about that. Change increases the capacity and the, to develop new skills, to uh, grow the individual as a professional. That's the change we're talking about, to grow and develop the individual. All right, next, please. So borrowing some of leadership traits, leaders set direction. Coaches also set direction. And coaches facilitate the decision-making. Coaches don't make the decisions for the employees. Don't give them the answer. Uh, typically, a manager will be expected to know the answer, expected to give the solution. In this case, we shift around and we facilitate for the employee to do some research for the employee, to think about it for the employee, to come up with options and solutions. And instead of being reactive, coaches tend to be proactive. Typically, a coach will create an action plan for the individual, an action plan that includes goals, objectives, starting dates, ending dates, strategies had to do and all that. And then that is follow. So it's not reactive to that. They are following a plan, right? And the focus is on the achievement of those goals. But as we do that, it's the idea to find out exactly you know, what's going on, exactly what's making the person tick. What does the person want? For instance, a lot of times, employee may be unhappy. The employee may be, you know, uh, you know, they, they, they're tired of what they're doing and they don't know what to do. Uh, typically, they'll go to the manager and say, uh, and ask for an increase. And the manager may not sure uh, that that's the case, but you know what? To keep them happy, they might give them uh, the increase. Two, three months later, the employee comes back and still unhappy, still not, you know, at peace because the increase did not solve the problem. So in coaching, we try to find out what's the truth. In coaching, we're trying to find out what is right. Only when we do that, then we're able to find the solution. So that will be something that you know is different from managing that we try to find out what's really going on in order to be able to find a solution. Next, please. So um, since we're talking about leaders, and since uh, we're talking about that you are going to make some changes in the way you are, um, you may be uh, 
the outing you sell, you may be thinking, well, what am I going to be doing? I don't know everything there is to know. But as, but as a leader, you don't need to know everything there is to know as long as you know which direction you're going. If you know the direction you're going, you'll be okay. Next one, please. So uh, we spoke a little bit about emotions. And there is a handout that was given. Um, it's a small, small primer about emotional intelligence. So emotional intelligence is discussed a lot these days. There's a lot said about there, written about there. So uh, I'm sure you have come across some, reading some uh, material about emotional intelligence. So here I'm going to cover two basic areas. And the two basic areas are the individual, the emotions in each of us, and the emotions and, and others and those around us. Looking at the individual, we all have what's called push buttons. We all have things that you know affect us. Like in the example of my client, when he was feeling hurt because his potential client was questioning his work, when his potential client got uh, himself another expert my client was feeling hurt, was feeling insulted by that. So only when he learned to manage that, only when he learned to be aware that that was happening and learned to manage, things change. And in the same way that he learned about his own emotions, he also learned about the emotions of his potential client when he realized that he was freaking out for the numbers and the figures that he couldn't understand. And he began, my client began to manage those emotions, and only then he was able to, you know, sign the contract and be able to go with the work once the emotions were managed on his own and the emotions on his client. So that'll be the thing when we're talking about dealing with others, be aware of what causes you to overreact and you have a handle on it, but also be aware what affects those around us, what affects those that you work with. So you are able to either minimize or you're able to manage that so that doesn't get in the way. Next, please. So we're talking about dealing, uh, part of the difficult conversation, we'll be dealing with complexity. Managing a difficult conversation is typically an example of a complex situations in which our emotions are going to be put to a test. For instance, if you have, say, you need to sit down with one of your employees because there's some performance issues or because there's some attendance issues. Typically, managers look the other way. Typically, managers hate to confront their employees. They usually say, well, why do I have to tell him or her you know, how to do the work? They are professionals. They're supposed to know. And they avoid doing that because it's a difficult conversation. So um, one way that I'm going to I'm going to give you a, a visual. I'm going to give you a mental uh, model that's going to help you deal with a difficult conversation. So if you know that you're going to be sitting down with one of your employees or a client or something, and you're going to be having a conversation that you know is going to be difficult, you know it's going to, you know, the emotions are going to be flying. Who knows what the reaction is going to be, some yelling and screaming or crying, whatever. You, you kind of anticipate that but you're gonna face it anyway. So one way, one way that you could do is, imagine yourself, you carry an empty container on your side. And this, the container is on the side in order to anything that comes from the person, any vitriol, any emotions, any screams or everything, you're going to uh, let it go into the empty container and it doesn't hit you because otherwise everything's gonna be directed to you. And that's going to be hard for you to deal with. But if you redirect that to the empty container, that gives you a chance to maintain a clear mind and a calm mind. And you're able to see, well, what is it going on with this employee? What's going on with this person? So I'll be able to help. So I'll be able to intercede uh, with a calm mind because everything is going to the side. You are able to uh, allow the person to spend themselves. And after a while, after they yell and scream, you know, they're going to come down but that did not hit you, did not affect you, and you were able to deal with a complex situation, right? Because one of the things as managers and as coaches 
is that you need to get comfortable with uncomfortable situations. And that is the mind switch that needs to happen in our mind. If we feel that we avoid the, the um, difficult conversation, then we're not going to be learning. But if we realize that as part of our role, we need to do that. And the more we do it, you know, the more we, especially with a model like that, or maybe with some other tools, you are able to confront that, you're able to dissipate that, you're able to handle that. So being comfortable in uncomfortable situations is something that for us to aspire as managers and coaches. Next, please. So I mentioned that we're going to be looking at uh, how do we communicate. And we are moving away from uh, the style of the managers that usually tell people what to do. And we're moving into the style of coaches that coaches usually ask. So by asking, we start a conversation. By asking, we uh, avoid people just you know, going and doing things without us knowing what's going on. And for instance, as a manager, you could begin to do that by, for instance, you have a new project. And typically, you will get a group together and say, okay, here's a new project, here's the deadline, you know, go do it. Now, that will be telling them what to do. But you could alter that a little bit by saying, you know, here's a new project, and what are we going to do is, here's all the details and all that, uh, you know, take a half a day, analyze that, and then we'll meet again because I want you to tell me, uh, you know, what are your thoughts? What are your ideas? How could we improve? So instead of just telling them, you could ask them, to, to participate, you ask them for their thoughts. And that begins a dialogue. That begins a conversation, right? Um, and instead of just telling them what to do, how to do it, you just, as a leader, you just set the direction and you allow them to participate in taking the project and running. Um, because what we want to do, instead of appealing them to their heads by telling them dates and deadlines and all that, you want to appeal them to the heart. Like, my manager, an example that I put at the beginning, she could have told me the details of the problem. She could have told me the, that we are late, that we're spending money, whatever the problem was, she could have told me that, and that would have been appealing to, to my head because the numbers and figures, you know, I process with my head. But instead of that, she appealed to my heart. She told me, Neptali, I have a problem and I need your help. The fact that she came to me like that, I didn't care what the figures were. I didn't care what the problem was. I was ready to help her because of the way she approached, right? And she used her personality. She used her charisma. And now people typically say that charisma, you know, you need to be born with it. That's not true. Charisma is something, personality and charisma is something that we all can develop, that we all can improve our personality, improve our charisma. There's a book called Enchantment by the guy's name, Guy Kawasaki. He talks about how being personable, how being enchanting, how being a good talker, you know, that produces better results than just being direct, being, you know. So you can develop your personality, you can develop your charisma, you can appeal to people on the, by their hearts. And the other thing that you could do in terms of, you know, when you're talking to people is uh, be aware if you use the word but. For instance, you could say, uh, somebody could come in and say to me, Natali, um, as we begin the project, I see that we could make some changes to improve. And I could say, oh, that, that, has, that sounds good, but, but, but we have no time. And that kind of kills the idea. You know, and the employee comes again and says, look, uh, we came across this and I think we could make these changes. What do you think? And I can look at that and say, oh, you know what? That sounds good, but we have no resources. And if I keep on you saying but and giving a reason why, you know, I'm killing the idea. And after a while, that person is not going to come to me anymore because he or she knows that I usually kill the idea by saying yes and but. Instead of that, instead of but, use and. So if the same person comes and say, hey, Nepali, we are about to start the project and I see that we could make these changes, I could look at that and say, hey, that's a good idea. And I'm going to look at the budget to see if we have extra money to do that. Right? By saying and, I'm keeping the idea alive. Uh, the employee then comes back again and say, hey, Nepali, we're in the middle of the project and I see that we could make these changes. And I could say, oh, 
That sounds like a good idea. And I'm going to look at the resources to see what we could do, right? Uh, by saying, and I keep the idea alive, not only that, but more important, the person is going to know that I'm open to those things, that I don't kill the ideas, and the person is going to keep coming. So if all the team members do that, you know, that improves the communication. That improves to the fact that I'm open to listen to them, and I don't kill the ideas by saying, yes, but. All right. Uh, next one, please. Okay, you can be right or you can be in a relationship. We were talking about building relationships. We were talking about the strength of building relationships. And as managers, uh, we are so busy with the deadline. We are so busy trying to meet their requirements that we forget that we can strengthen relationship with those around us, that we forget that we can have better relationship with our employees. And one way would be that, for instance, when you have your one-on-ones, uh, and you talk about work and you talk about deadlines and you talk about money and all that, leave a few minutes at the end to, you know, to talk something about the person, to talk about something about the employee. You know, you may know a little bit that the person likes the sports. You may know that the person has hobbies. You, you, it could even be that, you know, you have kids and they have kids. You could even talk about that for a few minutes, okay? You begin to kind of... Uh, try to find out more about them. And then you also uh, share something about you. So they begin to know you, or you begin to know them. And then relationship, relationships are like onions with layers. So you begin to lift the layers. You share yourself a little bit. They share themselves. And if you do that consistently, then the trust that you have with those people, with those employees, with clients, with colleagues, begin to strengthen because you're sharing yourself and they're sharing, and then you get to know them better, right? That's one way to develop uh, relationships. Next one, please. Now the answer is in the room. Uh, this reminds me, early in my career, I got first promoted to a management position. And Okay, so I was the manager and I knew about the work. I knew about the workers and all that. I knew you know, what to do, but I wasn't sure I knew how to be a manager. So I signed myself for one of those courses that focus on that. I think the title was the job of the first time manager. So I signed myself for that and I went. And it's one of those courses that take a couple of days. So when I arrived there, there's a big room. There were two trainers. And we were about 20 people in there. So that's the kind of training that, you know, you get to hear presentations. You get to read articles. Maybe we read a book. And also you get to do exercises. You, you know, you, can, you cannot get away without doing exercises. So this exercise was as follows. First of all, they asked for a volunteer. So a lady volunteer. And one of the trainers took the lady outside the room, they closed the door, and we didn't see her for a while. And the rest of us, there were about 19 in the room, uh, the other trainer made us form three groups into three groups. So we had three groups, and he gave each group a set of building blocks. You know those wooden blocks that kids play with? So we had a kit uh, of it. Each team had one of them. And he says, okay, uh, three teams, I'm going to give you an assignment. Uh, and the assignment is you're gonna have two minutes to build the highest possible tower with the building blocks. So you could see three teams, all noisy, all kind of doing all kinds of things. The towers were going up and they were falling all over the place because we didn't know what to do and all that. And then after a while, the guy says, okay, stop, everybody stop. You know. So he says, okay, now I'm going to show you how to build the tower. And he did. He shows exactly how to use the blocks, exactly how to put them together exactly how to get the highest possible tower. So here we are, three teams with three nice towers. He says, okay, now put please put everything back in the box. So we put everything back in the box. And then they, the door opens and the lady, the volunteer, you know, comes in. Unbeknownst to us, she had been told that she was being named the manager. And then we were going to be her team. And she was given the assignment to create the, the tallest possible tower uh, within two minutes. So she comes in like gunbuster. She opens the door and she says, I'm the new manager. I'm in charge here. You're working for me. And I'm going to tell you what to do. 
And we were trying to tell her, hey, you know, we know what to do. We have that. And she said, no, listen, quiet. We have no time. I'm going to tell you what to do when she proceeds to tell us, you know, how to be like that. So that was a lesson for me to rely on the people that already have experience, rely on the people that know how to do the work, right? So by developing better communication ways, by creating relationships with your people, you are able to foster collaboration. You are able to trust the people. So when there's a need to make a change, you don't, you're not gonna make the change to them. You're gonna make, you're gonna make the change with them. That way you're going to be the guy on the side and you're not gonna be the stage on the stage. All right, because the answer is in the room. Next, please. So to summarize what we've been talking about. So typically, uh, this is the traditional manager that we've been talking about. The manager focuses on control, uses control, uses the, uh, the authority that the title comes in and directs, directs what, what, to, what to do, how to do and all that. And is a problem solver. He or she has the answer. He or she has to make the decision, right? So hit it once, please. So from there, we are going into click once. Okay. Uh, only once. Can you click what? Okay. You can leave it like that. Um, so we're going from controlling the situation to clarifying, to explaining, to giving more information, to giving chance to people to learn more about the situation. From using the authority, we're going into influencing the outcome. Uh, many times, influence is more powerful than authority. Okay, and instead of directing, we are going to consult. We're going to ask them, well, what do you think? What's the best way we could do? Let's use your experience. Let's use, uh, you know, uh, things learned from the last project. How can we do better? You consult with them. You ask them. You ask them to participate. And instead of solving the answers, instead of giving them the answers to them, solving the problems, you enable them. You help them come up with the answer themselves. So that's one way to grow the people. That's one way to trust on them. And that's one way to give them opportunities to, to grow as individuals. Next, please. Okay, so at this point, I want to kind of focus on the following. Since we're talking about doing something new, since we're talking about adding a new layer to the position of a manager, um, it's worth mentioning that anything needs practice. So practice, practice, practice is going to allow you to utilize whatever you're picking up here. It's going to allow you to utilize whatever you have learned and then give it time. Uh, like anything, it takes time. I don't know what part of the world you are, but in the United States, they sell uh, a little bags of gel, gelatin. And the reason I mentioned that because for so many years, it has come with three instructions, three steps. And it says, boil one cup of water, dissolve the contents of the envelope in the cup of water, and three, put it for four hours in the fridge. And the idea is that even though you follow all three steps, you still don't have gel. You still have to wait for it to gel. So the same thing. You may have read the handout. You may have listened to what I'm saying. But give yourself time for it to click. Give yourself time for it to gel. And then also, you know, uh, educate yourself. Read some more. You know, find out some more. Get some podcasts. Get some articles. Maybe buy a book. Learn more about coaching. Okay. And then give it a try. Don't be afraid. You know, give it a try. Next. And if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more and become more, you are a leader. And I don't know about you, but being a leader is a high loved uh, aim of mine all the time. I hope yours too. Next one. Any questions? Anybody? It could be about coaching, okay. How can one build a relationship without coming off personal and not mentioning about personal self too? Uh, you could choose uh, a typical thing that is a neutral thing. For instance, it could be sports. Uh, if you know that the person knows about that, that, that could be a thing. It could be a hobby. It could be, it needs to be a sort of a neutral thing that allows you to re reveal something about you 
but it's also it's sending a message to somebody that you are open to other than just work, that you are also a person, that you also had a side that is just, you just not just the boss, but you also have other interests. And just the action, and, and, and you know, you could start small, especially if you're not the kind of manager that you share things with your employees, that's probably not gonna be an easy thing and it's gonna take time. Like I said, it's layers, it's gonna be slow. But, as, but you need to start somewhere and, as, and, and you need to be consistent. If you're, even though you do a little bit, if it's on a consistent basis, they will begin to trust you that, you know, you want to open up, you want to have a conversation. So it can be difficult. And, and, and that would be also, by the way, you will be changing the culture, okay? And changing the culture is not easy. It doesn't happen overnight. So you have to realize as a manager, if you begin to do something, it is you're going against the culture, especially if it's a culture that they don't do that, you know? So, but as a coach, you are thinking differently. As a coach, you are trying to create a relationship. As a coach, you are trying to focus on the individual, on the growth of the individual. And that's probably a shift uh, from being a manager that you just focus about the work, you just focus about the deadline. So you need to you know, change yourself and then only then you could do some changes with those that work with you. So it's a process. It's not gonna happen you know, overnight. How do you deal with the manager who is stubborn and refuses to receive constructive criticism because some of us are suffering, particularly in retail sectors? All right, so now we're talking about the other way. How do we go to the manager? And that may be a harder question, but it's not um, impossible. Uh, we were talking about influencing, all right? When you deal with the manager, you don't have authority to do anything, but you may have heard about something managing up. There's a way in which you could manage your manager. And if you don't know anything about it, you could read up about that. There's a lot reading about that. And it uses influence. For instance, if in the team, you are say the go-to person because you're the expert about something and people rely on you, you don't have official authority, but you know you, you know a whole lot about the product. You know a whole lot about the process and people come to you. That gives you power to influence things. And you could use that, but you have to be aware that you can do that. You have to be aware that you can make a difference. If you're not aware, if you don't feel that you can do that, then nothing's gonna happen. But So you need to begin with a mind frame that you can manage up. People, even somebody like your boss with a lot of authority can rely on you for things. And then you could slowly but surely begin to kind of dictate which way things should go without anybody realizing simply because they're asking you so you can influence uh, outcomes simply because you are the go-to person, simply because you know, um, you know you're an expert in the field. And so you don't have to have the position, the authority, but you can influence how things come out. How to get the talent out of your workers and get those talent help your project to grow. So that will be going back to what I said. Uh, begin to establish a relationship with those employees. Don't just look at them as employees. Don't just look at them, they were the ones that they do the work. Try to find out, you know, what makes them tick. Try to find out what goals they have, what values they have, you know. Uh, open up yourself a little bit to them and they will open up yourself. And the more you know them, in, you're dealing with an, uh, an individual. You're, dealing, you're not dealing with just an employee that does a routine. You're dealing with somebody that has other interests. You're dealing with somebody that has other ideas and you haven't had a chance to connect to that. So try to look for that. Uh, the worst that's going to happen is doesn't work, but you know, you're going to put uh, an effort. You're going to make the effort. People are going to uh, know you because you make the effort, because you try, because you reach out. If you have 10 employees and you reach five, you know, that's a tremendous uh, achievement. Um, if you don't do anything, you're not going to reach to anyone. And if you reach five, the other one, the other five are going to see that you're doing something and then slowly they're going to come in. So you have to start somewhere. And some people are going to react to you and some others not because that's the way it is. But that doesn't mean you know, you, you, you're you gonna stop. You need to change yourself. If you, if you want to make change, you, the change needs to start with you. 
So you need to show yourself that you are different. You need to show them uh, the coaching aspect of it, that something is coming new or something is new. And it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take time because trust develops slowly. But you need to be consistent. If you consistently keep making these changes, people are going to see you and they're going to trust you. So it's a matter of trust, creating trust with them. Any other questions? I think we will move ahead. Okay. So next slide, please. All right. So if you still have comments, if you still have questions, I am in LinkedIn. My email is there, Natali Bar Martinez. I don't know you're getting you. And I want to remind all of you to uh, disconnect from work. I want you to remind you to go out and recharge yourself. Rest, take a break. So here I am somewhere in Spain waiting for my tapas to arrive and having a fresh sangria. So remember to take care of yourself. And with that, next slide. I want to thank you all for this time and this opportunity. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Naptali, for the great session today. And wow, I'm blown away with such an interesting session. I'm sure managers who want to be coaches have lots of things as takeaway from the session. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. Our next session topic is leading the journey towards successful organizational transformation which will start at 11 a.m. EST. Looking forward to seeing you all again, and I would request you all to stay on the same screen where you have logged in. And once the next session is broadcasted, you should automatically be in. A feedback form will pop up after this session. I would request everyone to give their feedback.